is Rebecca Jernigan, your tour guide into discoveries, coming to you live from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web, satellite, and podcast. Let's journey together into the realms of the known to the unknown in search of enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful planet. This is your host, Rebecca Jernigan, and you're listening and watching Journeys with Rebecca right here on Camelot TV. Tonight is a guest, actually, that needs little introduction, Nick Redfern. He's the author of about 30 books. He's also been a frequent guest on many uh, prominent radio and television shows, which also include Ancient Alien, which is currently being seen, and he's being seen in those many episodes currently. Um, now, tonight we have a couple of his works that we'll be talking about. If we have enough time, we're going to be talking about two of them, but the first one we're going to start with is Bloodline of the Gods. Uh, then, if we have time, we're going to move into Weapons of the God, uh, again, time permitting. So, we're going to start by focusing on Bloodline of the Gods. This is Unraveling the Mysteries of the human blood type to reveal the aliens among us. It's a fascinating book. I've read it and I've, it's stuck with me. But in this book he shares information about the RH negative factor. He travels through time and geography to reveal how revealing this factor is. Where he believes it starts from, where it has gone and spread since then. It's truly fascinating work. And again, time permitting, we're going to visit Weapons of the Gods and he's going to talk about uh, about that and how it was and if it would actually nearly destroyed uh, this earth in the ancient past, some of these ancient uh, weapons. Now both of these books are obviously amazing work from this well-known author so if you have any questions tonight uh, be sure to write them in the chat box and Brian, my fabulous engineer and producer, he's going to forward those to us so that I can present the questions to Nick to answer for us tonight. So please be sure, though, if you are getting your questions in, that they're in all caps so that Brian can easily see them in the chat box and forward those to us. Now, um, if you have questions during the show, don't wait until it gets too close to the end uh, because our show is probably only going to be about 90 minutes tonight. And so we want to make sure that if you do have questions on any of the information um, and knowledge that Nick is going to share with us tonight that you get a chance to get that done. Um, and before Nick goes tonight, he's also going to be talking to us um, about some of the conferences and some of the locations that he's going to be at uh, in the next month or two um, across the United States. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Nick to the show. Hi, Nick. How are you? Hey, Rebecca. I'm doing good, thanks. Well, you know, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. You've you've been a, a guest of mine off and on through the years, and yep. I've followed your work, and you're just always so fun and so informative um, to have on the shows, and it's just, it, honestly, it's truly a delight. I tell you that before we even get on the air. I think you know that. Um, yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, well, you're very welcome, and it's much deserved. You're a much deserved, um, I guess, um, you're infamous in your own works and it's much deserved because you work really hard at what you do. It's really, really obvious by uh, the depth and the knowledge that you put into each of these books that you've written, all of the books that you've written, um, as well as some of the other projects that you have. Um, tonight we'd like to start with, and I know it's it's a book that's not one of your newer releases, which is Bloodline of the Gods, um, that's unraveling the human blood type. Um, you know, this I've had questions, just a ton of questions from people about this RH negative factor and, you know, what does that represent and, you know, obviously it's a, it's a lot of significance uh, to it and tonight you're going to be here to share that information. So I guess what might we might want to start with is just like what starts in Chapter 1 for you, which is what is the nature of the RH negative um, and then kind of go through the chronological order because it also talks not only about the development of it but also the geography of where it spread and what it did and of course we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Anunnaki in here and the gene gene splitting splicing and things like that it's just really fascinating stuff so I'm gonna let you go for it there dude I'm gonna be quiet for a minute okay 
Well, basically, the, the story that the book tells is of this small percentage of the human race um, which has what's called RH negative blood. <clears throat> and um, although, you know, outwardly at least, any of these people are, you know, just, just like the rest of us, but what's particularly intriguing is that there are massive um, numbers of people who are RH negative who've had profound UFO experiences over the years and the decades. And um, this has given rise to a theory which actually has a fair bit of uh, <clears throat> data and testimony to support it, actually a lot, um, to demonstrate that the RH negative people may have sort of a lineage that goes back to ancient extraterrestrials. Now, <clears throat> There's sort of a lot of confusion over, um, you know, sort of negative blood, positive, etc. Now, as far as blood types are concerned, the, the four primary ones are A, B, O, and AB. And um, they're basically, um, you know, the, the type of blood, the blood group that you have. Now, what we also have is the RH negative factor, which RH stems from the rhesus monkey, which is um, a, a type of monkey which actually is very DNA-wise almost compatible to us. And a lot of experimentation undertaken on um, rhesus monkeys is, is done purely and simply because we are so close to them. And um, But the RH factor which, as I said, because we're so close to them, runs through our, um, our bloodline, if you like. Um, we have people who fall into the category of negative and the people who fall into the category of positive. Now, basically, it all revolves around what are called the antigens of any individual person's blood cells. And antigens are a form of protein that are found um, on the surface specifically of cells. And they fight against things like viruses, disease, bacteria, things like that. Um, but what we have is a situation where, as I said, a very small percentage of the human race is what's called RH negative. Now, if we all originated with one particular, um, from one particular lineage, shall we say, you know, there's no real reason why we shouldn't all be RH positive, but we're actually not. Now, in terms of the figures, um, it's roughly about 2% um, to 3% of all Asian Americans um, are RH negative. In terms of African Americans, it's roughly about 12, 10 to 12%, something along those lines. And for uh, Caucasians, it's about 10 to 15 percent. And, and I say 10, you know, sort of roughly around that area because, you know, different people have come up with different um, figures, primarily because, you know, not everybody has their knows what their blood um, uh, situation is. You know, some people who've never been into hospital may not even know what their blood group is. So, you know, we don't have exact figures but you know we can sort of pretty much say that if you look at it across the board it's probably round about eight to ten to twelve percent of the population is rh negative now you would imagine that you know with with this small percentage of the population if they were having ufo encounters because they're a small percentage of the population to start with that their numbers, their figures of you know, UFO sort of pretty much equally say equally if you small. look at it, but it's the exact opposite. The the more and the, the sort of the, the larger number of encounters that we get in terms of the RH negative people, the big irony is it's been reported by an extremely small number of people. So in other words, they're intimately and directly connected to the UFO phenomenon. And um, one of the things I talk about is how this is not just sort of a modern day anomaly. For example, we find that the, the Basque people of various parts of uh, France and central Spain, um, their RH negative percentages are in between sort of 40 and 50 percent. And they have a lineage which takes them back to early humans like Neanderthal man. And so in other words, we can make a case that some of these early humans before Homo sapiens came along um, were themselves RH negative, and this sort of leads back to the big question of, um, 
you know, was ancient man genetically altered, possibly as a to create a slave race, and they were created with this RH negative um, lineage within them. So, in other words, that's sort of the theme of the book, looking at the RH negative factor today, how it relates to UFOs, and then demonstrating we can go back in history and potentially have a, an understanding of how this all began and developed. So, okay, so, you know, um, uh, obviously I read the book and I, I, I went through all of this. And when you're talking about the Basque people having this, what, 40 to 50 percent, you said, mm -hmm. uh, of yeah. the RH negative. And then you, you've traced that back to, like, the Cro-Magnon time and even the Neanderthals, et cetera, and so forth. So if we're looking at the RH negative factor, um, it, it's kind of a standalone thing uh, in itself, and it, it's it absolutely, the question that I have about that is, if there was 40 to 50 percent of those people that had that RH negative blood, isn't there something in that when we, you go backwards, because from there, you I don't know if you started your research from the beginning or if you had to kind of reverse engineer it, I would have thought you probably might have had to reverse engineer it to actually figure out where it stemmed from. Is that correct? Well, yeah. I mean, because we have this anomaly today with the UFO subject, but of course, you know, the human race is a very old species, you know. Um, and so the, the task then becomes, well, when did this all begin? You know, is it just a case that we're seeing anomalies in the 20th and 21st century, or are we seeing connections that go back not just thousands of years, but tens of thousands of years? And if so, why are we seeing it? So you're right, it, it is sort of pretty much, you know, the the springboard is the way in which the RH negatives are linked to the UFO subject today. But then you sort of have to demonstrate to the reader as to how and why it came about and what its origins were and... In other words, how the past has impacted on the present. Well, absolutely. I'm I'm still trying to to make the connection. I mean, if we are, uh, and and I I'm I'm really really big into the idea of, you know, our genes, our our DNA, whatever was was manipulated at some point, many times maybe, who knows? I mean, you know, we have a, a an idea, and this Rh negative factor m makes me wonder if that wasn't part of a a, a concentrated gene pool, in a sense. I don't know how else to say that. I mean, a concentrated well, gene pool that, that you know, helped to bring the humans here, and then it evolved through the Neanderthals, the Cro-Magnons, to the Basques people. Um, and and that, that in itself is probably that, you know, there's an energetic connection, obviously, to the UFOs, extraterrestrials, if that's what you wish to, you know, go for it. I mean, do you understand what I'm what I'm saying here? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we find to sort of answer your, your question or the, the the point you write you bring up is that when we look at the the RH negative people today, as I said, you know, we find ourselves digging further and further into the past. Now, people like, for example, Zachariah Sitchin and Lawrence, the late Lawrence Gardner suggested that. Um, visiting extraterrestrials who they thought the most likely candidates were the, the Anunnaki, um, visited the Earth in the distant past and became, in terms of like Sumerian law and mythology, they became their gods, if you like. Um, and the theory that both Gardner and Sitchin supported was the idea that the Anunnaki genetically altered very sort of early proto-humans sort of and i'm not talking about like neanderthal neanderthals or crow magnons but way way before that you know sort of just the, the very uh, almost like ape-like smaller creatures about four feet tall genetically altered them um and what's interesting is that although there are a few downsides to being rh negative which we can come to as we go on there are actually a lot of positive issues um for example, the RH negatives are quite robust and resistant against a lot of viruses and diseases. Um, so one of the theories that's been put forward is if you're going to create a slave race to do the work for you, as you know, the theory is with the Anunnaki, then 
you would want that slave race to be not just hard workers, but not prone to falling sick as much as, you know, the average ones that hadn't been genetically altered. So, in other words, it could well have been a case of creating a slave race, genetically altering it so that um, it becomes robust and formidable and, um, you know, it doesn't sort of tire easily, etc., etc. That would have been, you know, the perfect species, you know, to create. Um, now, what's intriguing is that we find with, for example, Cro-Magnon man and Neanderthal man sort of 40, 45,000 years ago, the barriers are still sort of being pushed back pretty much every year. Um, but we know that this was sort of roughly the era when they began to surface, but they surface pretty much out of nowhere. You know, and that's one of the curious things when we look at things like the theory of evolution, where, you know, some people will take the view that evolution, you know, is 100% correct. But then we have these anomalies where we see quite adv advanced entities surface from nowhere. Now, for example, with, with the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons, you know, if you think of those sort of people, and particularly when you were at school, you know, you'd have this image of... Um, you know, the caveman with his club in one hand, wearing this sort of bearskin outfit and dragging his wife back to the cave by the hair. You know, that's sort of the image that you have when you're a kid. And it's almost the image that you're taught. But the reality is that the cro magnons and the Neanderthals were highly evolved. Both, for both of them, their brains were bigger than ours. Um, we know from some of the remnants of findings in the caves where they lived that they were extremely skilled artists um extremely good at sort of uh, cave paintings um on the walls you know so if you look at the cave paintings in france for example but i mean they would rival anything you would see in you know an art gallery or a museum um we also know that they had uh, rudimentary uh well we say rudimentary we don't really know but we know that they did have um, certain musical instruments, like early types of string instruments, um, which, you know, you put all this together and you have a, a being, an entity, if you like, far removed from this idea of, you know, something straight out of, you know, some old old time sort of movie, you know, of, of cavemen or something along those lines. Right. Um, and of course, then this begs the question, how did they evolve so quickly and so skillfully to have all these talents? Well, what's, one of the things I noted when I was doing the research is that in certain portions of the planet where particularly um, the Cro-Magnons and the Neanderthals uh, proliferated, these are areas of the planet where today there's a higher percentage of Rh negatives. Uh, so the classic example is the Basque people of, of both uh, France and Spain. They're both areas that were rich in early types of humans. So when you put all these aspects together, the, the geographical distribution of the Cro-Magnons and the Neanderthals, and then we look at it today and we see the Rh negatives in those areas, you know, a strong case can be made that these early humans were Rh negative. Now, if you look at the Basque people, and this isn't meant as a, an insult or anything like that, but if you look at photographs of them, they do look slightly Neanderthal-like. Um, you know, they have broader faces, much more powerful-looking jaws than the average person, and they have a more powerful and robust-looking forehead. Um, so in that sense, you know... The, a, a great deal of research has been done to, to suggest that the Basque people are sort of the last meaningful line going back to, that could be traced back to the Neanderthals. Um, you know, obviously across the course of thousands and tens of thousands of years, they've, you know, they, they look like the rest of us, but there are distinct differences so with the forehead, with the broader nose and wider jaws, etc. Um, so if we can make a case that the original sort of early proto-humans were genetically altered, they were modified to be Rh negative and robust and, you know, resistant to disease. And then, and we find they were, you know, um, affected and altered by extraterrestrials. And then we find that today's Rh negatives in the Homo sapien uh, community, you know, that they're linked to the UFO subject. So, you know, we're seeing all these different strands that seem 
totally separate until you start to put them together and you realize that there's, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you've got all the pieces on the floor and you just don't see anything. But you start to put them together from the past to the present and you see all these almost eerie connections that sort of align it all together. Well, you know, one of the things that um, I think is, is, you know, you look at, like you were talking about, you know, people think that cavemen were just, you know, running around with clubs and grunting and, you know, doing all that stuff. But as you pointed out, you know, they were they were actually great artisans. They had a larger brain. But our modern societies, um, even just several hundred years back, and I say that with tongue-in-cheek, modern societies, um, <laughs> they have a tendency to put in a perspective what what they understand in the now which you know we all live what they consider very civilized lives right we live in houses that we build and you know go to the store and buy our foods and you know et cetera and so forth we drive cars and so that's what makes us different but even though the the crow magnon man and the neanderthals and 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 all of those you know older um races or older beings, older civilizations, whatever you want to call them, you know, they were highly, as you said, highly evolved. Just because you view them from this modern day perspective doesn't make them less than. In some sense, I think it makes them more than because they're, they were probably more connected to, obviously more connected to nature um, and, and just to being than, you know, even you and I are today, even some of the most awake and aware and and connected people, um, you know, just because they do things different doesn't make them uncivilized. But I think you're absolutely right about all of that. Um, I, interestingly enough, I've had a few visions about that kind of stuff in the past, and I always thought, now why are they showing me stuff like that? You know, it was specifically about, you know, I think that I was looking at some Neanderthals, and it was just like viewing them from a distance, and they were they were highly social. Um, you know, well, they, we know they lived. We know they lived in families, and we know they also had burial rites. So they understood the concept of what death was, and and life was, and you know the and the meanings behind them. Um, and there are also indications that they were quite spiritual in their own ways as well. So they may have had, you know, um, a belief in like the soul and the afterlife and things like that. So, um, you know, when you when you look at that. You're right that we kind of had this sort of very simplistic approach. Oh, they were cavemen, and um, you know, and that's basically it. You know, yeah, they well, club people. Right, you know, they right. hunted, they hunted mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. And they club <laughs> people, and they sat around fires, and that's all they did. You know, for yeah. forty, fifty years or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Which what a drive life, you insane right? if that's all you did. If that's yeah, all you yeah, did for nothing years, in between. You'd go crazy. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and you know, speaking of uh, the the idea that you can still see some of the characteristics of of that in in some of the people with the broader foreheads. You know, um, I was watching something the other day that fit right in with this, where they were talking about there's only just like I don't know seven. I, I'm I'm not thinking that number is correct, but like there's only seven basic features to the human face and to the human body shape. And um, they can determine, you know, what what that is by just looking at you, um, by your facial structure and your, your structure. And if you look at that, um, I th the, that whole premise, that scientific premise, I think there's there's certainly some validity in what, what they're providing with that information about the basics. So what you're saying with the uh, people that are of, the, are of the Basque people with the 40 to 50 percent RH negative, um, again, even though it's an unseen thing, which is the blood itself, it still is part of the original structures, whatever that was. I think there's, I think there's a big key here to, you know, again, pieces of the puzzle, even though it's not exactly on point with your book here. I think it's also maybe an extension of that where you can look at all of that and go, well, you know, this fits in with that and fits mm -hmm. in with that. And and so I believe that people with these UFO and, and uh, extraterrestrial communications and things like that, yeah, I think some of them are more predisposed to it than others, just based on whatever their genetic profiles are, whether we're talking about, you know, the bloodlines, which in this case is exactly what we're talking about, um, as well as... Um, 
the physical structure of, and that's all done by your genetics. You know, I mean, yeah, and I, it's cool. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about the Basque people is that, you know, they're in, you know, they're in the heart of, of uh, Europe, uh, France and Spain. But what's interesting is that they have a unique language which isn't derived from any other language uh, in Europe anywhere. It has no sort of connections or similarities with words, and you know, across Europe. It's just solely unique to them. Now... You know, obviously the, the English language is very different to the French language, but there are some words which are extremely similar. And you find that in other European countries. But as I said with the Basque people, their language is unique to them and to no one else. Um, so that has sort of given rise to the idea that their language is a very ancient one, possibly even, you know, um, derived from early humans that had their own languages that we'll probably know, never know anything about, but that may have sort of derived, you know, the, the Basque languages may actually derive from of these, some of these early human languages that, you know, complete, <coughs> excuse me, completely sort of elude us today. We'll, we'll never really know, you know, to what extent they communicated, how they communicated, how many, you know, words were in their vocabulary. I'm, I'm guessing probably that it was far more than people think. You know, the idea that after 30,000 years or 20,000 years, you would just be sitting around grunting all day is just <laughs> stupid, you know. <laughs> that, that, that would be far more involved than that. I, I would think so, yes. Absolutely. And, you know, that's always been something that's been kind of sad to me is because some of these old ancient texts that they have, you know, uh, dug up regardless of where they found them, whether on clay tablets or metal uh, books or whatever it is, th that th I don't think they're being necessarily um, uh, done right in the language. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, Nick? Um, translated it correctly because the languages are lost and there is no previous information on what those words or symbols or whatever it is could actually mean. I also think that the Egyptian hieroglyphs as a, as a point here is that they're, they're not even being translated correctly. I think it's way different than what they think it is. Um, just my opinion, um, been well, there. Well, I mean, I mean, you make a good point there because there are good indications that ancient man actually thought quite different to we do, the way we do. You know, we sort of, as I said, look at everything very simplistic and it's this or it's that, etc., etc. And that's no fault of our own. It's just the civilization and the technology we have, you know. It's, uh, no, it goes by what you But if you look at ancient man, you know, they, they lived very different lives. You know, they was, their sort of actions were dictated by the sun and the moon and the planets you know, and every little thing that happened in life, you know, um, had meaning in it that goes beyond just the way we look at things. I mean, you can go back five or 600 years ago in England, you know, if a black cat crossed your path, that was a major thing. You know, if the crops were blighted one year, it was because the, you were out of favor with the gods. You know, the, their approach to life was far, far different to ours. And, um, you know, they may have even sort of, communicated and acted and interacted with each other in very different ways to the way we do. You know, they were obviously weren't sitting around playing Doom or whatever, you know, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but they were more, I think they were sort of more spiritual in the sense that they were connected to the planet around them, whereas we're just connected to looking at our iPhone, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't want to go down that path, Nick. That opened up a whole can of worms for me. I <laughs> All right. Well, I, and I have to agree. I mean, I think there's just so much more. I think we need to, we need to get rid of the boxes that, that, you know, that um, people look through, which is they, they measure by what they know and they understand. And it's about looking at what they may not have known about or what, is the possibility and there's so many potentials and possibilities out there that we haven't even thought about of where this could come from and where it is I mean even talking about this RH negative I mean I think the research I have, by the way I've looked for somebody to come onto the show and talk about the RH negative factor because I do have 
so much of the audience that was so interested in that because there's some people out there that have this RH negative blood and people know there's something to it. And you are the first person that I know of that has put it together in such a way that you have back engineered it, talked about where its potential was, talked about its concentration, where it actually sits at now, and then you filled in the blanks from where the beginning of what we understand as the beginning, so to speak, and then connected it also to the extraterrestrial world and the UFO, um, you know, ufology. I mean, that that's that's pretty good. I have to say that's pretty good. And speaking of oh, that, um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, when you mentioned the whole issue of UFOs today, you know, that demonstrates to me that even if this genetic breeding or, you know, transformation of early humans went on tens or even hundreds of thousands of years ago, as people like Sitchin suggested, um, then the very fact that the RH negatives today are so intimately linked to the UFO subject suggests that this genetic program is still going on. And I think it could well tie in with sort of alien abduction stories and accounts of hybrid babies, hybrid children, um, the so-called greys extracting egg, sperm, DNA, um, cells, that kind of thing. And right. um, so I think, you know, what we're seeing, what we saw in the past was probably a very visible exploitation of early humans, you know, where that's why we have so many of these ancient religious texts where the gods were flying around all over the place and they didn't care about being seen. I think today when we're sort of, you know, we've infested the entire planet and we've got all this technology, the so-called gods have retreated to where they deal with us on a very sort of covert basis rather than an overt basis. In other words, they stay in the shadows, they abduct people, they don't show themselves that much. Um, now, whether that's for sinister reasons, you know, or to protect themselves, who knows? But I think, you know, by default, the fact that the RH negatives have this link to the Anunnaki and then a present day link, there has to be, it can't be just random, it can't be just coincidence that the past and the present have sort of crossed paths on this issue. It has to be an ongoing thing. Oh, I, I, I totally agree with that statement. Um, and I, I like your uh, whole presentation there about uh, maybe the gods have retreated and that they're more covert than they used to be because, and it's mm. true, I, I do believe that. And the more the more I, I get into this uh, whole idea behind the mythology, behind, you know, Zeus and all of them, you know, you come to realize that there's probably more truth to that than there is fiction, right? Um, and it's, yeah, it, I mean, it, it, yeah. I, I just do. I just think there's just way more truth to it than there is fiction. Well, yeah, I mean, you can look at all ancient cultures, and, you know, and they all had their gods or their single god, um, you know, whether it's the Christian god or the ancient Greek gods, as you said, Zeus, you know, etc. Um, you've got the Egyptian gods, Indian gods, you know, Native American, um, Australian Aborigines, etc., etc. And... You know, although when you start getting into religion, of course, it sort of polarizes people in the same way that politics does, you know. Um, but in saying that, you can find in just about every religion stories of these higher sort of supernatural humanoid beings coming to the planet and manipulating the human race. You know, you can like the stories of, you know, um, the gods coming down and taking human wives and then he gives birth to the sort of demigods, sort of half-human, half-god type entities, which gets into things like the Nephilim, you know, and the men of renown, and some of these early humanoids living to extraordinary lifespans, you know, like Methuselah and Adam and people like that. You can place a lot of that into a context of an extremely advanced extraterrestrial science rather than you know, supernatural entities waving a hand. And I don't mean that disrespectfully to people who, you know, are into, you know, religion. It, it just is. You you can, you know, place it into different categories. There's no doubt about that. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. So as you're going through, as we're going through this, your your book here, and we're getting into some, you know, pretty specific information on this, this RH negative thing, 
was really a, a very fascinating read for me and I have since forgotten my own blood type I haven't had my blood taken in years and years and years and I can't remember what it is um, at all so I have no idea if I'm uh, RH negative or not I know that, that you talked a little bit about the positives we're going to get into the, some of the negatives and what that kind of means for people some people mm -hmm. Um, some of this was pretty educational for me because a lot of it I didn't know. So this was a, a really good book. So even if somebody's not so interested in maybe the UFO um, connection or the extraterrestrial connection, they can get a lot of geography and a lot of uh, a lot of scientific information and some medical knowledge, if you will, on on the RH factor. Um, especially if they know somebody that has RH negative blood in their family, but. You you talk you you talked to you've mentioned the Anunnaki a couple of times so let's 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 delve into that for a little bit and how they may you think they may have been a factor in it and then we're I'd love to go into the whole uh, we we covered it a little bit into the gene splicing and mm -hmm. then um, you get into something in your in one of the chapters here which is talking about colliding worlds and nuclear attack and I'm I want to mm -hmm. tie that into something else. Um, that you've done as well so um, maybe we can go with that point the Anunnaki and the gene splicing and stuff like that well yeah I mean there's no doubt that you know were it not for uh, Zachariah Sitchin you know certainly the, the story of the Anunnaki wouldn't be a sort of high profile as it is today now you know there's nothing new about the Anunnaki I mean you know the stories of them you can find in ancient Sumerian texts going back thousands of years. It's not sort of a new phenomenon. It's just largely been brought to a new audience. Um, but, you know, they, they were essentially the, the, the gods, the deities of the Sumerian people. Um, and so for that reason, you know, they, they were pretty influential and significant to the people of that era and that location. Um, but Zachariah Sitchin was someone who extensively studied the ancient texts, the ancient legends, etc., and came to the conclusion that the Anunnaki were not gods or supernatural beings, but they were just like us. They were flesh and blood humanoid entities, but from another world. And this is where it kind of gets a little bit con controversial. Um, Sitchin suggested that they came from a planet called Nibiru, which he believed orbited our own sun, but with such a great massive orbit that it only came close or closer to the Earth every three uh, to three and a half thousand years. And because of its large size, when it got close to the Earth, the, the incredible gravitational pull from Nibiru would have a massive disastrous effect on the Earth. Um, in the sense that, you know, it would cause polar tilts, it would cause massive earthquakes and floods, and essentially, you know, would, would just provoke complete disaster all across the planet. And Sitchin believed that it was things like this that led to flood legends, you know, and the and just the, the destruction, the very mysterious destruction of entire swathes of different animals, uh, roughly about 10 to 12,000 years ago across North America and elsewhere. We know they died extremely quickly and under odd circumstances. So Sitchin tied all this in, and but his view was that the Anunnaki came here essentially to mine gold, and the the idea being they mined gold uh, as a, in, in essence, as a way to save their planet, which kind of sounds a bit strange, but it actually parallels something we're doing today, which is research to actually try and plug holes in the, our Earth's ozone layer by taking gold, reducing it to a very fine fi uh, powder, and then essentially sort of uh, releasing it into the ozone layer to plug the gaps, so to speak. And um, this was something that the famous physicist um, Edward Teller uh, was digging into for years and saw it as a very viable issue. And so uh, Sitchin felt that the Anunnaki were doing something very similar. Um, but while they were on the Earth, um, he concluded that, you know, for the early people, 5, 10, 20,000 years ago, they viewed them as gods, and the Anunnaki may even have um, encouraged that view, so to speak. But from there it goes that, you know, they took human wives, and then, we, as I said, we have the stories of these demigods, half-human, half-godlike entities that look like us, but they were anomalies. You know, you had these 
the, the so-called giants suddenly surfacing, which um, Sitchin felt were the product of anarchy and human crossbreeding. Um, he also talked about, you know, uh, entities like Goliath, you know, as another example of how the, the gene pool had been sort of contaminated, if that's, if that's the right term, by the Anunnaki, who were fair, some of them are supposed like sort of fairly arrogant entities who just, well, this is what we're going to do, you know, like it or not. Others had sort of sympathy for the, for the early humans and so forth. Um, but the story gets sort of more controversial where after a, a certain amount of time, the Anunnaki kind of splintered and they turned on each other. And had uh, sort of like nuclear turf wars on the planet. They fought each other, but on our planet, which led to, as Sitchin felt, led to stories like the destruction of Soma and Sodom and Gomorrah, that, you know, it wasn't the wrath of God. It was one faction of the Anunnaki launching atomic weapons on another faction of the Anunnaki. Um, <clears throat> and he also believed that the Anunnaki had managed to, I won't say conquer death, they weren't immortal, but he felt that they had managed to understand the secrets behind, or the, the process, I should say, behind why we age, you know, and why some people age quicker than others, why some people live to be 110, why somebody else might drop down at 30, why somebody who's 30 might look 55, why somebody who's 55 might look 25, you know. Um, and he felt that they'd managed to find a way using something known as white powder gold um, with, to um, essentially bring the aging process to a halt at a period of your own choosing, which is highly controversial again. But, um, you know, was, in other words, it was a case of creating the closest thing to immortality as possible. And um, the, he also felt the idea that this crossbreeding may have led to some of these stories of, you know, people like Methuselah living to almost a thousand, you know, and uh, his offspring and his grandparents, etc., all live to sort of like their 900s and so on. Uh, people will tell you that, well, that's just down to, you know, different um, kind of, um, you know, the way they measured age in the past. But, you know, it may not be the case. They may really have had extensive lifespans. And so um, all of this comes into play with, with the Anunnaki. Yeah, that's a, Zechariah Sitchin was the one that really, uh, I read uh, his books in the beginning. Um, not an easy read. He wasn't easy to read at all. But totally fascinating. No, I, he was just totally fascinating. And it just opened up a whole new world of... Uh, understanding for me in his books, and I, I it just really started me on a path. So, um, got me thinking about you know getting outside of my own box before that term was even coined, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so as we move forward, you talked a little bit about uh, all of that, but let's. Uh, the other thing that struck me in the book, you talk about a lot of different things in this book, and it it really does tie into this RH factor. I'm just going to kind of uh, blow through a couple of things here, and and then. I'll stop and see, you know, you could just kind of let me know what you want to chat about. Lilith was one of those ones that I think is misunderstood a lot. Uh, the, you talk uh, about incubus and succubus. You talk about fairies and little people and human, uh, human reproduction. You talk about uh, close encounters with Celtics. Um, we talk about the, you talk about children of the gods and black-eyed children and missing time and reptiles from the stars. I mean, it goes on and on. These chapters are just one after another, and yet it all ties into this RH factor thing. So I'm going to kind of let you, uh, you know, kind of flow through some of those things, and let's see where all of that takes us, especially uh, the ones that I mentioned, plus a bunch of the other stuff that I didn't yet mention. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, the the issues you brought up just then are all sort of highly relevant to the story. I mean, you mentioned the little people, you know, and um, I always have to sort of preface this by, when I talk in the book, you know, there's a chapter on fairies. We're not talking about sort of little Tinkerbell-type <laughs> creatures, you know, with sort of shining with these little wings and flitting around the Christmas tree or whatever. Uh, nothing like that at all. That's sort of the very modern imagery that people have of fairies. But if you go back to sort of, say, four or five hundred years ago in, you know, in Europe and the UK, where I'm originally from, because we're not part of Europe anymore, in case you didn't know. Yeah, I did. It's, it's exciting. <laughs> but 
But um, so, you know, you have these stories of fairies, but back then they weren't, you know, anything like Tinkerbell. They were sort of dwarfish, quite sinister beings that would live underground and they would come out at night and they would break into people's homes and steal babies, newborn babies. And they were actually viewed from, you know, they were feared as much as they were sort of revered as well. It was sort of one of these things where, you know, you had to sort of pay homage to them, otherwise they'd come round and, you know, make your life hell, that sort of thing. And um, the, But the stories are interesting because, you know, you've got these sort of little humanoid creatures that would steal babies, which actually parallels sort of today's alien abduction stories of the dwarfish greys, you know, um, taking allegedly unborn fetuses out of pregnant women. Um, we have stories where, for example, the fairy queen um, with, very often was described as being infertile. She had problems um, giving birth to fairy children. And so what they would do, they would kidnap a man, take him to the fairy kingdom. He would have sex with the fairy queen, you know, and then the baby would develop. That's very similar again to where cases where men have said, you know, they've been abducted, sperm's been taken from them, and then perhaps further down the line, they're shown this hybrid baby or hybrid child and told that it's theirs. You know, the, the parallels are so close. You know, you, you can look at it from the perspective in the 21st century, we have a 21st century mindset, and we can understand technology and science. Back then, you know, is very much more simplistic, not to, you know, not to take a downtrodden approach on the most, you know, simplistic approach, but it was. And so, you know, one person's grey undertaking genetic experiments, uh, you know, of a reproductive nature today could be another man's position 500 years ago, kidnapped by the fairies. And very often, people would come back from the fairy kingdom thinking an hour had gone by when actually two days had gone by so you even have the so-called missing time component as well um and again I, I include this in the book because it demonstrates that five six hundred years ago there was still this genetic angle going on you know it didn't suddenly stop when the anunnaki were satisfied with what they were doing you know it continued and you know you also talked about lilith lilith is one of these sort of very sinister characters that pops up very briefly in the bible but also in other ancient texts and um Sitchin concluded that she was one of the anunnaki um now the story of an of uh, Scooby of lilith is that she would, was just this sort of quasi supernatural woman she would break into uh, people's homes in the middle of the night have sex with men and the sperm would be used to create these um, strange-looking offspring that she gave birth to, which again parallels today's hybrid babies and hybrid children. Um, and from there, from Lilith, we have the story, as you mentioned, also of like the incubus and the succubus, these, again, supernatural entities that would manifest in people's bedrooms in the middle of the night and have sex with them. Um, and so we have this component, as I said, that runs through the entire stream of things from the past to the present. Now, to bring things into the UFO era, you know, it really sort of kicked off in the early 60s, the, the whole abduction thing and, you know, the genetic angle. There had been a few cases beforehand, but largely it all began with the Betty and Barney Hill case of September 1961. Um, when the Hills were driving to their New Hampshire home um, after being on a vacation, they'd been to Canada and Niagara Falls, and were driving home, they saw this strange light in the sky and couldn't figure out what it was, drove closer, had images of seeing this object coming down and these humanoid entities looking out of these portholes or windows, and then realized, you know, they're on the way home and they'd missed a couple of hours. What had happened? Suddenly they'd gone from one scene to another. Well, like a lot of abductees, they started to experience missing time uh, or a sense of missing time and had weird dreams and nightmares. Now, what's particularly intriguing is that after a case of, you know, enough was enough and they decided to get uh, hypnotic regression, it turned out that on board the craft, Barney uh, was laid down on this bed and um, a specimen of sperm was taken from him. But also on top of that, supposedly the aliens were running their fingers up and down his spine, which kind of baffled him with hindsight. He didn't know why they were doing that. But what's interesting is that 
a larger than average number of people who are Rh negative have an extra vertebra in their spine. That's one way to identify them. So it was kind of intriguing that Barney Hill said he felt with hindsight the aliens were counting his vertebra. So that might have been they were trying to figure out, in, perhaps in a quick fashion, was he Rh negative? You know, and um, so that in itself takes us into the 60s, you know, and then certainly in the 70s and 80s with people like Bud Hopkins, Whitley Strieber, and then into the 90s with uh, the late Dr. John Mack and David Jacobs, people like that. We're seeing the old phenomena presented, but in a new format, you know, high, as I said, hybrid babies, hybrid children, um, alien abductions, scientific and genetic experimentation. But it's, it's no different to the stories of the Anunnaki or the diminutive little fairies, the little people, right through Lilith, Incubus, Succubus. It's all pretty much the same phenomenon, but interpreted in different ways by people with different cultural insights and hindsights, you know. Yeah, I think people miss, you know, again, it's like you're talking about the the puzzle pieces. Individually, they don't mean anything. You know what I mean? They're just they're just in yeah. a, a, a thing sitting out there all by itself, a singular thing. But then, you know, when you start seeing them pop up everywhere and throughout time, throughout our, our known history, um, and certainly probably unknown, I'm sure it didn't just start, right? Um, it, it's it's there. It's all there. You can start connecting the dots and all these stories. And it really is very fascinating how all of this really flows together very, very well to kind of create a, a much larger picture of who we are and where we all come from and what is still, what is still out there. You know, what is still there? It hasn't left just because we're we're modern day. We consider ourselves modern day, right? Five hundred years yeah, from now, we'll be right. we'll be ancient history. No, you're right, and I think you know, for, for me at least, you know, when you talk about putting these threads together, certainly the weirdest aspect of the whole Rh negative phenomenon, and it's also a dangerous aspect of it, is that if, say, for example, you have a man who's Rh negative, and you have a woman who's Rh positive and the woman becomes pregnant by the man, what you then have is a, is a mismatch where one is negative, one's positive. What actually happens in that circumstance, you now normally, you know, although the, you know, the, the mother obviously, the pregnant mother, uh, her body feeds the growing baby, the growing fetus, you know, for that nine-month period, but for the most part, you know, their, their actual bloodstreams, you know, don't cross. Now, what sometimes happens, though, is that, you know, sometimes, like in a medical procedure, if, you know, um, a sample has of a cell has to be taken out, you know, that um, sometimes there can be a mingling of the blood. And sometimes, even when there isn't, what can happen is that the mother's body, being Rh positive, recognises the growing fetus, which is Rh negative, actually recognises it as sort of, no pun intended, as alien, to her body and the mother's body if the, the correct drugs aren't and medications aren't provided the mother's body the mother's immune system will actually try to kill the unborn fetus as bizarre and as sort of horrific as it sounds it's sort of a natural reaction to try and get out of the woman's body something that the body perceives should not be there so and but the, the good news is you know people shouldn't worry because that's one of the reasons why you know, when a woman becomes pregnant, one of the first things is to ask, you know, what is your blood group? Because it's extremely easy to combat this potential problem. But before we had the relevant drugs and medications, and even in parts of the world today where, unfortunately, you know, they, they still don't have them, some of the poorer countries, it can still be a major issue. So when you look at it like that, you know, that an RH negative baby can be potentially killed by its own mother because even the mother views it as so unusual and different then you recognize that this is a really profound and strange aspect of of, of the human species yeah i i i always thought uh, when i read that i was like isn't that interesting and then i i started thinking back uh to some people that i personally know that have had problems with uh stillborns or or the you know not being able to carry to term 
uh, babies because they, you know, they just can't. And it always made me wonder, I wonder if they check their blood type, you know. And uh, so it, it's, it, it's really a very fascinating thing. But, you know, there is something very easy to assist people uh, with that. So I'm glad you brought that point up is that it's not for anyone to worry about, but just certainly to make sure both partners are um, tested uh, if they don't know what their blood type is to make sure so that there isn't any potential issues down the road. Um, yeah, and I mean, if you're both, you know, if you're both RH positive, you're both RH negative, there's no issue, you know, it's not a problem at all. Uh, probably the most infamous um, example of, of that is Lee Harvey Oswald, who was RH negative, and, and his wife Marina, they were both RH negative, so, uh, you know, they, they were able to have children with no problem, but it's when you have, when one is one and one is the other, that's when issues not necessarily will occur, but they, but they can occur. Uh, but again, you know, this comes also down to the issue of pregnancy, which is something that crops up throughout this story of, you know, the alien angle of RH negatives. Um, you know, pregnancy, babies, children, multi-generations, it, it's all part and parcel of the story. Yeah, it is. And it I, I, I see that as just, you know, a real major portion of information that I think people really need to know about too of the importance of it uh, for sure I, I, I really like the connections that you've made with that um, one of the things that that came up when I was looking at this when I was reading the book you know a lot of times when I read somebody's books I'll, it, it takes me into another space and I you know I start developing pieces that come in you know inadvertently and this also ties in, besides the RH negative, let's talk about these black-eyed children because I think people need to know a little bit about what they stand for, what they are. It's an, again, it's, an, it's, it's a phenomenon that has been brought forward to people's attention in the now time. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the story of the black-eyed children is a relatively new one. You know, it's only sort of been around the last decade or a little bit more. But it revolves around, for people who may have heard of the phenomenon but aren't really sure what it is, basically involves these sort of young children who are usually described as male, sort of um, 11 to 14 or thereabouts. And they have this very white, pale-looking skin. Um, typically, they wear black hoodies, come out late at night, and try and find any way they can to get into the targeted person's home. You know, they knock on the door late at night and we're lost, can we come in and use the phone? Or we're hungry, we're homeless, can you give us some food? Variations on those kind of themes. But people really don't let them in when they see their eyes, which are sort of the entire eye is just solid black. I don't just mean the center, I mean the entire eye is black. So it's no wonder people, you know, don't, um, don't let them in. Um, so, you know, when you look at things like that, then you see... A situation where we have, for example, parallels between the black-eyed children and uh, ancient phenomena as well. And I explain what I mean by that. Um, if you go back to back to, as I said, to you know the whole issue of um, the times of the fairies and things like that, what we have is a situation where they had these strange-looking children as well. They were known as changelings. Um, Changelings were sort of like a, a human effigy that were left in place of the stolen babies um, that the fairies took. But you also had the sort of half-human, half-fairy uh, type of entity where, you know, the, the children looked odd. They looked strange. They didn't look like the fairies, and they didn't look human. And you can make a good case that, <coughs> excuse me, that's exactly what the black-eyed children are, that they're something that looks human but when you get closer to them they actually don't look human at all um so you know i think there isn't a great deal of difference between the changelings of the past um and the the black-eyed children of today so if if one of these came to your door what would you do uh, well, I wouldn't let them in, put it that way. <laughs> I'd, probably, I'd try and get a photograph, and then I'd put it all over the Internet to say, hey, you know, they, they are real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I, so, um, 
I get a real impression <laughs> that they're super fast too. I don't know why. Well, well, I mean, people might think that because they're sort of very elusive, but you know that you find a lot of these kind of aspects in some of the related stuff, like the women in black and the men in black. You know, the men in black are very much like. Uh, the black-eyed children, they both try and find their way into the home. They don't force their way in. They have to be invited in. Um, and, you know, they have all ex different excuses to get in the house. And obviously they dress in black. They've got, like, a hat component. The men in black wear old style fedoras. The black-eyed children have got a black hoodie. And the the witness always gets this weird vibe that they're not looking at something that's entirely human, whether it's the children in black the black-eyed children, the men in black, or whatever. So, you know, again, it's a case of putting these threads and angles together to figure out exactly who or what they are. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think that, as strange as it might sound, you know, these old stories from 500 years ago of, for example, you know, the, uh, the changelings and these um, uh, sort of semi-human, semi uh, fairy, if you like, or the little people, children, I, I think they're, they're one and the same with what we're seeing today, just with a different name, that's all. Oh, yeah, see, I I will tell you is that people have asked me about the, the black-eyed children, and I will tell you is every time I go to look at them, you know, to 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 see what that's about, I, I just can't get there. I just get this so goobiness about it that I just, I can't look at it too deeply. I just, I can't get a, I don't know. I'm, well, it's, it's just, I cannot well, look at it deeply. I mean, there are some unsettling aspects to it. You know, the idea that, you know, in literal terms, we may just be a genetically altered species, you know, uh, under like somebody's lab experiments, you know, and under, undertaken for their own benefit. You know, I mean, it's like with the story of the Anunnaki. Although they were, they're not sort of presented in Sitchin's books as our enemies, you know, they essentially did what they did for their own ends and their own purposes. They didn't really sort of care too much about us, providing we got the work done that they wanted us to do, you know, this Correct. slave environment. Um, it's sort of, kind of like with abductions today. We're sort of constantly told, or the abductees are constantly told, you know, this is for your own benefit, for your own good, for the greater good. Well, we've only got their word for it. You know, if it's, their, if it's for the greater good, why not come down and say hello to all of us? Why skulk around in the middle of the night, you know, abducting people and taking eggs and sperm and, and cells, etc.? You know, and what's the deal with the black-eyed children? It, it's almost as if, you know, we, we're sort of, we're not seeing the full picture. You know, I sometimes wonder if we're like the equivalent of the, cow in the slaughterhouse you know everything's cool he's got a nice farm plenty of grass to eat the farmer looks after him gives him a nice home you know with a cover and a roof and everything else but then one day you know the truck pulls up and takes him away maybe i don't think it's that drastic but i i think it could be similar in the sense we're not seeing the full picture of what is being done to us um you know and this gets into some of the really sort of disturb, or disturb some people where you had abductees talking about how they felt their soul was being removed from their body and um, one of Whitley Streeper's um, entities that he met and that he described in his uh, 1987 book Communion he was famously told that their whole purpose was to recycle human souls you know the idea that again you know that the life we live now is sort of just only part of it and you know the next step is almost like some bizarre factory type environment where we're recycled into somebody else and then recycled into somebody else and uh you know so maybe in some respects it's better we don't know you know it might just sort of blow our <laughs> well, minds it would know? certainly change the way you live your life wouldn't it well it would you know i mean and maybe not I, I guess, positive well you know it's kind of ironic because there are these ancient legends where you know, if you go back to sort of ancient Greece, where they believed that there was like the a duality of the soul, as they called it, where, for example, there was one portion of the soul that essentially dictated the character and, you know, the mood, and et cetera, of the person, but the other part dictated the actual literal personality of that person. 
but the the belief was that when we die the part of us that makes you rebecca and makes me nick is lost but the the essence of of us survives as the soul you reborn into the next life that's why you don't have memories for the most part of that previous existence because the life memory part of the soul is lost but the essence of your character continues on which you know is a kind of immortality but it's a you know it's a pain in the neck because you don't remember the previous time so uh, but who knows you know i mean a lot of this is sort of theoretical and in speaking to people you know i i find a lot of people get disturbed when i tell them that so you know i always stress it's a theory and you know we're either going to find out or we're not you know yeah 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 for sure um yeah i can see where that would disturb some people because i mean i i i i you know i mean it's, it might be some validity to that i mean i don't know i mean it certainly doesn't doesn't kind of coincide with you know how i perceive things but you know nobody has all the well, answers no, I mean, right that's, and that's an important thing you know i mean that's important you bring that up because the worst thing that we could do would all agree with each other and then to find out we were all wrong. You know, I think, you know, it's kind of like politics. It always ends up in an argument, but we all learn something when we have a good political argument. And I think it's kind of the same. There's nothing wrong with a bunch of people interested in UFOs sitting around and having almost a fist fight about the nature of abductions because that's what we need, you know. There's no point playing it safe, you know, just for the sake of getting people on seats in conferences. That's that's not what I'm about, you know. I prefer to sort of challenge people and say, hey, you know, this is interesting, it's controversial, but let's get it out there and see what people think of it. And, uh, and I do sometimes wonder, you know, if there is validity to this, you know, idea that somehow the greys are connected to the afterlife and Strieber probably more than anybody else pointed that out. If that is true, and I think there are a lot of things in its favour, then that might be one of the reasons why there's so much government secrecy. It may not just be that aliens are coming here and abducting us. It could actually be the government doesn't know how to tell us that the aliens, or what we think are as aliens, are somehow connected to the human soul. You know, it'd be far easier to say, well, the aliens, there's somebody else's equivalent of NASA coming from Zeta Reticuli or from wherever. It'd be very difficult to say, we suspect they're somehow manipulating our souls. That would, that would probably cause worldwide chaos if it was true and it was revealed, you know. Whereas just the idea that aliens have visited us and occasionally crashed, that would be amazing, but it probably wouldn't spark that sheer fear that the other angle probably would yeah I, I could see that i could see that i could see what you're saying if it's true of course yeah. right i mean and again i don't they, everything is so compartmentalized and so spread out there's so much history right there's so much information mm. that we have never been privy to none of us at least in this well, life why, cycle well that's why when what i try and do with my books you know sometimes i get accused of sitting on the fence which is basically garbage i don't sit on the fence what i do is i don't force feed a particular belief system down people's throats because my i take the view that we don't really know what the truth is we've got a lot of concepts and ideas and theories and data which push things down certain paths but until we do, until we know for sure i don't think it's a responsible approach for me to take to say I know for sure that aliens are recycling souls, or I know for sure that we were the product of visiting extraterrestrials hundreds of thousands of years ago. What I can do is present data and explain why I think it adds validity to this theory or to that theory, but I'm not going to sort of, you know, bang on the pulpit and say, you will believe this, because that's, that's taking things down the wrong path. So... I think if I can present people with concepts and ideas that they then think about and other people think about it and then they look into it and we can get more information, I think that's the responsible way of doing it. The irresponsible way is to present scenarios and theories from as fact when we don't always know what they are. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying it's a theory, providing you admit it, which is what I do. You know, I, I don't want people to you know, think that I'm, 
you know, saying something unless I can back it up. You know, if I, if I can't back it up with fact, I'll say, but we've got suggestive data that points strongly in that direction. I think that's the way it needs to be done, always. Well, and I, I, I don't disagree with you there. I mean, you know, um, when I'm talking to people and I share my viewpoint, and I'll say, this is my viewpoint, and, and I, I stress highly, highly, that if, if somebody's telling you something and it does not resonate with you, if it does not click or if you, if you get, if there's some kind of a trigger that you, you're not digging when somebody's presenting something, then you need to do your own research. And that means yeah, that right. you have to be objective when you're listening to any information. I don't care if you're listening to the news, a politician, to this show. Doesn't matter. If it, you, 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 you never just become a blind follower to the information because you'll, that'll never lead you to your truth, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. and, and I no, think you're right. And I, I think that definitely applies when we're dealing with stuff like this where it does go back, you know, into the sort of furthest reaches of, you know, early civilization when we're trying to interpret ancient texts on the Anunnaki or, you know, was Ezekiel's wheel a spacecraft? You know, it, it, it can become difficult. Um, and that's why I think it's important to look at the threads, you know, that these very often overlooked threads uh, that run through like the story like the bloodline of the gods or that run through abductions and genetics across the centuries and um and you know for me i think the best we can say is that there's a real ufo phenomenon it interacts with us to a very intimate degree but also in a very standoffish way as well and maybe it does that because it wants us to make mistakes ourselves and learn from them i don't know you know it's kind of like What's the best, well, I probably shouldn't say this, but what's the best way to teach a little kid to swim? Well, you know, kick him in the swimming pool. <laughs> He'll swim. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you know, it's like, how, how do you teach a little kid to ride a bike? Well, put them on a bike, and if they fall off, they'll get back on again, you know. Um, that's always the best way is to literally jump in at the deep end with something. And uh, maybe that's the, that's the, the way that um, the aliens do it. Um, you know, they let us take our own approach. You know, it's kind of like um, the bird that never leaves the nest. Excuse me, the bird that never leaves the nest is going to die of starvation eventually, or it's going to get kicked out. It's got to jump out or fly out and find how to, you know, find a worm to eat itself. You know, that, that's nature. That's that, it, that's the same in every species. So maybe we're seeing something. Um, similar in relation to ufos that for whatever reason we have to find the answers for ourselves in some respects at least so here's a question i don't think i've ever ever asked you uh, there's actually got two questions are you rh negative i actually don't know what i am i've um okay uh, fair enough I've i didn't know what i am either so here we are two dummies <laughs> for um I've, uh, i mean knock on wood and uh I am going to knock on wood, <laughs> just to be safe. <laughs> knock on wood, I've actually never uh, needed blood to be taken or anything like that. Um, oh, bless your heart. That's yeah, excellent. I've, yeah, I've never sort of um, had a disease or an illness. So I get oh. colds now and again once a year, but that's about, we all get them. Yeah, for so, sure. Um, so, I, yeah, I couldn't, I, I guess I ought to really find out. It might be interesting if I find out I'm RH negative. <laughs> exactly. And the next question I have for you, have you ever, do you think, are you an abductee? Have you had your own UFO experiences? Or is this just something that has oh. just been a curiosity for you? Passion of, well, uh, well, it has been a curiosity, but there have been sort of a few weird things in my Family. I mean, I'll explain what I mean by that. My, my dad was in the British Royal Air Force um, for a while. He worked as a radar mechanic, and he was involved in several UFO incidents where the radar operators were tracking these weird high-flying objects, fast-moving objects, um, across the English Channel and the English North Sea. Um, and my dad was brought in to check out the equipment to make sure it wasn't creating sort of false readings, like shadow-type readings on the screen. And sure enough, they were working fine, and then turned out that other military bases up and down the East Coast line were also tracking these objects. And my dad and everybody, like the, the radar operators and the pilots of the planes that were sent up to intercept them, everybody's told not to talk about it. And my dad told me that when I was about 12. 
and that 11 or 12, that got me interested. But one story that I don't talk about that often, but I don't mind, I have no objection to talking about it, is that round about the same time my dad told me that story, my mum said, well, you know, I've got a, another weird story like that, which my dad didn't know about. And my mum said that when I was about... I, I was born in November, and I think she said it was like about February or March. She woke up in the middle of the night to hear this sort of resonating humming noise outside the window and got up and my dad wouldn't wake up or couldn't wake up. And she felt she had to take me to the window, and that was the last thing she remembered. So, you know, it is kind of odd that my dad had that experience, my mum had the experience with me, and then I have such an interest in UFOs. You know, it does kind of what it sort of almost makes you think... Do you actually have any sort of free will, you know what I mean? Or is I, it all kind of pre-programmed or destined to be this or to be that, you know? And, and I sometimes do wonder if we are sort of living in kind of almost like a matrix-type world, you know, where we reality as we see it isn't actually as it is. And, you know, I do get a lot of weird synchronicities. And, um, you know, if you think of synchronicities and how they happen, and sometimes the sheer weirdness of them. We, there has to be more to reality than we're seeing, but it's just we don't know what it is isn't, or what it is that we're not seeing, or vice versa. But, you know, the idea, you know, like if you've seen the Matrix movies, you know, Keanu Reeves and everybody else is sort of fast asleep in this dream world, and the real world is, is something else. I sometimes wonder, you know, if it is kind of like that, that we're not seeing the world as it as it really is in some fashion. And maybe that explains things like precognition, you know, people who have prophetic dreams um, and fate and destiny. Maybe it's all sort of interconnected. And uh, it's all getting kind of deep, isn't it, really? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, the other <laughs> it started day, off with aliens and um, negative blood, and now it's sort of going to some very deep philosophical area. <laughs> that's all right we enjoy it and, and i just i'm gonna throw my two cents in here and just say the other day again i was again i was presented with the idea that we're all just literally 2d we're 2d we're not 3d mm -hmm. and what we think and which goes along with the matrix idea which is the holographic universe right mm -hmm. and that this that what we're experiencing is actually something that's projected and, you know, you think about stuff like that, and you, you, it actually saddened me when I heard that, and I thought, well, now, wouldn't that be just the crap? Wouldn't that just well, be... Well, it would. It would, but, I mean, it, to, you know, it's so sophisticated that, you know, we don't sort of realize it um, until, you know, it's kind of like they say the movie, you know, it's like a glitch in the Matrix, you know, when something goes wrong. And, you know, it's like in the movie, they, point, they say that deja vu is when there's a glitch in the Matrix, you know, and you your mind suddenly swings back to when the program's sort of got a fault in it. Um, maybe maybe it's something like that. Maybe sort of paranormal experiences are due to the fact that there's occasionally a glitch, you know, and um, I mean, who knows? But, you won't uh, know until after we leave, I guess. Maybe not even then. No, we'll find out then, and uh, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, yeah. Well, I hope we're both wrong in regards to, to those movies and information. I really do. <laughs> that would just be something else. So we've only got we've got a little under ten minutes here. We just it's just flown by. This hour and a half has just flown by with you. Um, so I'd like to kind of wrap it up and, and pull this all together. We're obviously not going to get into weapons of the gods tonight. So, um, but I before I forget, one of the things that brought me that I wanted to remind you or uh, share with you is that in your chapter seven. In the book Bloodlines with the God, you called Colliding Worlds and Nuclear Attacks. And then um, not too long after that, you came out with Weapons of the Gods. So there certainly was a correlation there. There was some kind of a dot connection for me uh, and your books. It was like this seemed, that seemed to be a perfect follow-through with this Bloodline of the Gods for some reason. I don't know what that clicked in oh. for me at the time, but I just thought that was kind of interesting one to share that with you. Oh, well, that's good because the book, the the books actually, there's a trilogy of them. There's Bloodline of the Gods. Now, as you pointed out, there's a chapter in there that deals with the Anunnaki and nuclear war, and that's the theme of Weapons of the Gods, which is the follow-up book, which deals with stories of ancient nuclear warfare 
you know, like in the Mahabharata and Sodom and Gomorrah and things like that. And then there'll be one that comes out in December, which is like the end of the trilogy. I, the publisher asked me if I was interested in doing three God-type books, and I said yes. And so we did Bloodline of the Gods, Weapons of the Gods, which had just come out. And the new one, which comes out in December, is called Immortality of the Gods. And that deals with some of the stuff we talked about tonight, like the recycling of souls and um, the secrets of immortality and things like that. And that will be, you know, I thought that was sort of a, like a good way to round off this trilogy. And uh, because I don't, you know, I'm fascinated by the subject, but, you know, I have a lot of other interests. And I felt that a trilogy would be a good way to start and end my sort of role in this aspect of the stuff. Absolutely. Well, okay. So we'll talk a little bit about what's coming up here in the future. Let's let's uh, let's finish this up so that we can talk a little bit about the, the next book that you did and, and the one that, that you just got released a couple of days ago and then, of course, the one in December. Um, but back to the bloodlines, we, we, we talked a lot about the positivity of the RH negative. Um, maybe you can uh, wrap it up on like your last four chapters. You talk about military abductions and the RH negative blood, the negative us versus them, um, mm. a bloody uh, controversy, and then negatives and inherited memories. That was your mm. last four chapters in Bloodlines of the Gods. I think maybe you could probably wrap that up in, uh, you know, four or five minutes, and then we'll talk about yeah, all sure. your wonderful stuff coming up in the future. Well, you know, when you talked about like, the military and so on, there are actually a number of very interesting cases where abductees who are RH negative have been sort of re-abducted, but by what sound almost like black ops type organizations who don't seem to have all the answers, but they clearly seem to know that there's something going on with the human race and certain people having been selected or chosen. Um, you're chosen sort of a controversial word because, you know, some people are critical of the RH negative things, say that people are trying to promote, you know, one group of people over another, which, which is nonsense, you know, that's just sort of um, fear-mongering. But the, the reality is that, you know, that the military does take an interest in all this, um, but, you know, we, we're not sure to what extent even their knowledge is. Um, but as for the other aspects, I mean, you talk about this sort of us versus them angle, you know, I, People have said to me, you know, is there anything to fear from the RH negatives? I said, well, no, there's not, because they're just like, they're like the rest of us. And it's not even an us and them, you know, we're all human. Um, but what it comes down to, I think, is that, you know, the RH negatives clearly have a deeper affinity to the UFO subject than a lot of other people do. Um, but it's not like, you know, it's not going to be like The Walking Dead where we're going to wake up one morning and it's <laughs> us versus the negatives, you know. It's, it's not going to be like that. that. They're as normal as the rest. We're all exactly the same except for the fact that they have a lot of profound, strange things go on in their lives, which is largely out of their hands because it's a genetic thing. You know, it was, they were born with it. Um and as far as, you know, the, the other aspect, which is a very interesting one, this angle of inherited memory, um, the idea is, that, you know, why is it so many of the um, RH negatives have an affinity towards the UFO subjects? You know, not just that they've have been abducted or, you know, they've had contact experiences, but from an early age, they feel drawn to the subject and they don't know why. And this hits on areas like, for example, a genuine area of, of really interesting research called inherited memory, the idea we can pick up traits and possibly even fragments of memories from our parents and grandparents. You know, you obviously, you know, somebody might have the same bone structure or the same nose as their parents or the same lips, same hair color, that kind of thing. But there are indications that it doesn't end there. You know, there are these stories who've had organ transplants and the person who's got a new heart, shall we say, suddenly develops a craving for one particular type of food, and then they find that the donor loved that particular type of food as well. Um, and this sort of then crosses over into the idea, you know, could we actually inherit fragments of a memory that our great-grandparents had, you know, in the American Civil War or something like that? And if that's the case, perhaps with the RH negatives, that affinity they have for the UFO subject could be provoked by p 
previous generations who are exposed, of RH negatives who are exposed to the UFO phenomenon, and some fragment of it is picked up by them today, even if they're not sure why or how even. Makes total sense to me. It really does. That makes total sense to me. Um, well, whoever, whoever, if I ever is sort of... Um, I guess sort of inherited something uh, from one of my sort of long gone ancestors in England. It was probably a love of beer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we do like our beer in England, so that must yeah, prove something. You know. yeah, I'll, I'll take a good stout any day. <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about uh, the bloodlines of the gods, and then we are going to have you back soon I hope very soon we'll we'll get something set up here in the next few days for some okay. dates for you to come back on and talk about weapons of the gods now you talked about your book coming out uh, at the end of this year but you also had that new release of women in black that came out here in July 2nd now that book is on its way to me and as soon as I get it um, we will then schedule you uh, for that one to come on and talk about women in black okay. um, because I think that's that's fascinating to me I'm so glad that somebody's finally uh, putting the female aspect into all of this uh, because I think we've been left out quite a bit the females in in, in most of the stories I find that rather interesting as well uh, when a lot of people don't know about the, the the women in black story it's not like a ghostly story it's, it's sort of the, they are like the female equivalent to the men in black they you know, turn up at people's houses and try and find a way in and then threaten UFO witnesses. But like the men in black, they sort of look a bit ominous and strange. They're very pale and larger than normal eyes and um, almost as if they're like a hybrid. So, but again, it's like with every book, I try and write about something that hasn't really been covered to any great extent because I, saw, I like to put myself in the position of the reader. You know, you want something new each time. You don't want just Rehash recycle stuff, right. whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we'll be talking about that, and then what's your book coming out? What's the name of that again? Uh, Immortality of the Gods? Yeah, that one will be out actually in late December. Okay, um, we'll probably won't do so that one then until after the first of the year, until after that okay. comes out next year. But I can't wait to have you back on, and we'll get you scheduled. But I know you've got some um, appearances that you're going to be at. I'd like you to take the last minute or so here we've got and let people know where you're going to be and where they can get your books. Okay, well, all my books are available on Amazon. Uh, most of them you can get off the shelves in Barnes & Noble. Um, people can reach me at my blog, which is called World of Whatever. So if you just Google Nick Redfern World of Whatever blog, you'll find me easy enough that way. Or you can reach me at Twitter, Nick Redfern UFO, and Facebook as well. And as far as the upcoming conferences are concerned, I've got one the first weekend of August in Defiance, Ohio. It's called the Dogman Symposium, and it deals with very strange phenomena of all across the United States where there have been a lot of reports of werewolf-type creatures. So the, the entire conference is de uh, devoted to these so-called dogmen. As I said, it's Defiance, Ohio, first weekend uh, in August, the Dogman Symposium. And then in September, I think it's the second week, excuse me, the third weekend in September, I'll be speaking at the annual Mothman Festival in mm. Point Pleasant. And it's the 50th anniversary of the Mothman sightings. So this is going to be sort of a huge conference. It's like a big festival that they hold outdoors um, where they block off the downtown areas. It's like a, it's almost like a state fair, but for Mothman. So uh, I'll be at that one talking about the, the Women in Black book. Well, absolutely fabulous, and as as usual, Nick, this has just been an absolutely fun time with you. I can't wait until we uh, bring you back on again. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. It's, as always, it's my pleasure to have you on, and I look forward to some future shows with you here this year. And wish you luck on your conferences. Um, and for the rest of you, thank you so much for joining us, and if you're listening to this after the fact, thank you again. And until we meet again... Where will your life's journey lead you? Many blessings, everyone, and good night. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. Good night, Nick. Good night.